this is this is this is Well, I'd love to get into, you know, your background, all things Mad Caddies. You know, I'd love to know, you know, you know where you came from, like how you came up in the music industry and, and just doing music, period. Uh, but first, I got to say, congratulations. Well done. I love your latest release, House on Fire. Um, it's a, oh, thanks. Man. It's a great little Thank group you so much. of songs. Yeah, it's an EP. You can get through it pretty quickly, actually. And uh, I've just kind of had that on repeat uh, last few days, and I'm really digging the just quality tunes, like right from the get go. So, well done. <laughs> thanks, thanks, man. I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. Thanks. Yeah, dude. yeah. No worries, man. I mean, you guys have come so far songwriting. I'd love to talk about that too. So, look, I don't know where we should start. We could start anywhere. Um, it's been a yeah, little man. while since since we saw each other. Yeah. So. Hope you've been well. Oh, Europe probably like two summers ago or something. Yeah. So, I feel like a couple sub pre pandemic festivals. The summer before the pandemic. Yeah, that was always yeah. a good time. Always uh Slam Dunk, I think it was. Uh the last time I saw you. But Yeah, anyway. Slam Dunk, you were playing with, with Goldfinger, right? Yes. Yes. So I always yes. love seeing you guys play live. You guys play so well together. You have such a I don't know. The sound is so meshed and so sweet. Like uh, a lot of punk bands, you know, it's just, just it's a mess, right? It's just out there, and it's. But you guys, mm -hmm. you guys have, of course, your rock steady, your sky. You've got some reggae. You got all that, whatever it is you got going on in there. But it's a really sweet blend, and you guys have always struck me as an amazing band to see live. So how did that all come about? I mean, how. How oh, did, thanks, man. How did how long have you guys been you, playing together? Um, this is the 26th year of the Mad Caddies. We formed in 1995. So, um, right, right. Okay, last year was 25 years. Yeah, yeah we were we were on our way to uh, start our 25th anniversary tour in March. Like literally the day the the world, or at least California, shut down. Um, it was like March 11. It was Saint. It was like a week before St. Patty's Day because we were going to do a run with Flogging Molly, a casino run leading up to St. Patty's Day, supporting those guys. And then we were like headed off to Australia like a week later, and then like we had a whole world tour planned, and the wheels came off like for everybody. That's but insane. Um, yeah, yeah. So we, we were literally on our way to SIR to go grab gear and go play Harris. It was going to be our first casino run. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm in my 40s now. We're doing direct support on a casino run. Like, sick. Well, I was waiting for this day, you know? And, uh, that means you had a career, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what was, would, but, was uh, there so any inkling uh, of, of what was going on? Or Oh, yeah, totally. You're I, just kind of trying to go I, uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the jumping off point. Uh, well, it is. It's the jumping off point of the last year of, of this new solo thing I started. And uh I, I was in Ojai with my girlfriend. We had just started dating, been dating a couple months, and um, we were doing a little weekend because she was going off to um, to cook at this uh, retreat up in the hills there, and I was headed off on tour. And so we did a little weekend thing, and I was telling her, I'm like, I have a feeling both of us are getting turned around. I don't think kids are coming to the science camp, and I don't think I'm playing at Harris tonight. I just have this feeling. I mean, listen to the radio. They're saying everything's shutting down. They're not going to let a rock concert go on tonight with 2,000 people indoors. I'm like, sure enough, like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon, boom, all the management. Yeah, it's done. It's done. I'm like, oh. went down to L.A., got got a bagel and, a, and an orange juice and turned around, came back back to Santa Barbara. I'm like, well, yeah, okay, so now what? So, yeah, that uh, that was that. And um, Man, solo stuff. So uh, that, that, that took care of the that, that took care of the twenty fifth anniversary tour. But yeah. yeah, so the history of the band. I mean, is that is that where we're at right now? Sorry, I got sidetracked. With no, no, no. I mean, I, I love what, what we can talk about. So how do we how do we get our sound? Yeah, how do we get our sound? Um, well, let's talk about Santa we, Barbara. You just mentioned Santa Barbara. So is that where sure. Mad Caddies are from? Yeah. Well, Santa Barbara County. We're we're um, we found. Ah, sorry. Um, we grew up in San Inez Valley, which is kind of north of Santa Barbara, up in the in the hills. It's wine country. Um, kind of a bunch of a rich LA people came up and do the wine and everything. Um, started it in the late seventies, early eighties. Before that, it's just cattle and um, agriculture. It's really beautiful. Um, it's where I'm sitting right now. Um, and uh, 
there wasn't a lot going on here. And there was like five grade schools that all fed to one high school. And so um, the caddies kind of got together then. Um, in high school, we met and we were all musicians and kind of had our little grungy rock bands and stuff. And then kind of like the best of, of all of us kind of left the little first garage bands and came to form what would later become the Mad Caddies. And first we were called the Ivy League. And yeah, we started in high school and playing in barns. Um, our drummer, Todd, his parents had a little ranch and they had a barn and my parents had um, some property. Um, and uh, so we all kind of started in two barns, really, on either sides of the valley. And um, we just started playing music and we had big dreams. And we we're like, yeah, you know, we had started... This is, you know, sophomore, junior year now. We're starting to see national acts come through Santa Barbara, which is a half hour away. You know, saw No Effects and Skank and Pickle and Sublime and um, started seeing Blink-182. They were just like kids, you know. And we were like, man, those guys, if those guys can do it, we can do it, you know. And uh, started started to get this feeling because as you started to watch more and more shows, you're like, okay, there's the great bands. Then a lot of bands come through. You're like, okay, those guys were cool. And like, I think, yeah, yeah. It, it just gave us hope. And so um That's very cool. quickly what, what, we built momentum around our what was the main, main venue you guys would go see shows at back back then when you're start, um, starting um this place it changed names a lot um in santa barbara but we had two venues we had an all ages venue that moved around a few times it was always in like community centers or churches called the living room i'm sure you guys played there over the years mxpx and yeah. um yeah. and then there was also the, the that was in galita and then the underground in santa barbara which was like all ages, but had full bar in the back. So it was rad. It was the best of both worlds. And as a teenager, you could go there. You had to pay the extra couple bucks for being underage, you know, and they give you a free Coke or whatever. Yeah. And um, we saw all the great bands there, man. I mean, everybody came through there for like years. And we started opening up and getting, you know, doing the pay to play, sell 50 tickets at our high school and get to open up and then get paid nothing, but be super happy. Yeah. You know? So that was <laughs> yeah, the that's... first breakthrough locally like into like starting to do good shows when did you notice people paying attention to mad caddies like coming to see your shows um like we we had a big group of friends we were kind of the the kids that got along with everybody you know we could go to the parties with the hicks or the the preppies or you know we were kind of surfer stoner dudes and so we were friends with everybody and everybody liked us and <clears throat> even the jocks and everybody so like and we're a small town, so if the small town little valley kids, there's only at that time growing up maybe fifteen thousand people, which consists of like four little villages that all, like I said, feed to one high school. And so it was a big deal that we were like playing in the big city of Santa Barbara, you know. So it was pretty easy for us to sell fifty tickets, and like our kids were like right away. The promoters were like, "Whoa, these kids like bring people." Like, yeah, we brought our whole class, you know, or whatever. Like, everybody came, and so right away we felt supported by our friends, which was really cool. Because if they believed in us and they said they told us we were good, we were like, well, they're not going to lie to us. They're our friends, so at least we got a shot. And then um, the big breakthrough for me was uh, the second time we opened up for Skank and Pickle. Um, Mike Park was like, "Hey, I really, I really like that song, Preppy Girl. You guys play. I'd like to put it on a compilation." And I was just like, "Whoa, my God, guys!" And we made like Mike Park likes us. Like we were just like, "Ah, uh, we're not worthy." And uh, that was the big moment. Um, and then, uh, yeah, shortly after that, we, we all borrowed some money collectively from our parents, a few hundred bucks, and we scraped together, I don't know, I think like 1,500 bucks, enough to go into the studio for, for two or three days. I think it was three days. And we recorded what would later just be Quality Softcore, our first record. We thought it was just a demo. And we recorded that in 1996. And then um, Fat Mike heard it later, uh, like three days later, Joey K happened to walk into the studio because he was working on Lagwagon stuff. And and heard um, Angus, our buddy, um, mixing. He goes, oh, what's that? He goes, oh, this band called Mad Caddies. Or, no, we hadn't have a name yet. So we you were in the studio when, when Joey walked in. Did you know him? Uh-uh, we weren't. No, no. I mean, we were like new lag wagon, of course. But no, because <laughs> yeah. those, la Joey, Joey and Mike, those guys are all 10 years older than the Caddies. Yeah. So okay. they were like the older dudes, but I'd seen lag wagon play like three times. Anyway, um, yeah, so Joey goes, oh, man, Fat Mike's looking to sign a ska band, you know? And, uh, shoot, this sounds pretty good. I should send it up to him. So he sent it up to him. And, like, I mean, I'm talking, like, four or five days after we recorded that demo, Fat Mike called Sasha, our guitar player. He's like, hey, it's Fat Mike. And Sasha's like, fuck you, Chuck. What do you want? He thought it was me fucking with him. He's like, no, it's Fat Mike. San Francisco. And he's like, oh, shit. And, like, that was it, man. They signed us. And, like, 
the next summer, you know, we were on tour 97. You guys had the van with the, like, the couch in the back, I remember. And, you know, we were in our first van, and yeah. we are like, you know, we just jumped on Warp Tour for, like, two weeks at the very end of 97. <laughs> but, oh, man. And then that, that, that was that. And then here so we are funny. sitting now. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. And the fact that you remember. It was just a small town fluke, you know. Yeah. Like, so Joey Cape, you have him to thank a little bit for your your success. He's pretty much single handedly responsible for getting assigned to Fat Records. Yeah, <laughs> like, thanks Joey, hey, fucker. Joey. That's amazing. <laughs> and you remember the couch that we had in our van? Mm -hmm. We had this couch. It wasn't nailed down. It wasn't. At, it was just no. Sitting it was just, in the. It was just like a, a love seat in the back of the van. I'm like, see, these guys are fucking punk, man. We got to wear seat belts. Our bench seats suck. Let's just put a couple couches in here. <laughs> it was so comfortable, so dangerous, so but so comfortable. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you guys also only had three people, so in the band, so yes. that made it a little easier. I think. I think at the time we had. Let's see on that. I think we might have been still rolling like eight deep on stage it was just ridiculous like three horns two guitar players and i was just singing at the time wasn't playing guitar yet. i was like oh my god we're never gonna feed all these guys it is we gotta so, whittle it down <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned that because you're not the first ska band to notice and mention noticing the mxpx living situation the fact that we have, we have three people in the band like it's just so different yeah. it's like a different world i, I couldn't oh, imagine yeah. what you must be have gone through what what were some of the craziest oh, uh, living situations that mad caddies had to endure on a tour well i mean just the first two years 97 and 98 we put in a lot of a lot of months on the road especially in the summer you know and we had no money we weren't getting any money so you know 100 i think hotels back then if i remember like a a decent one like a red roof or a super eight was like you know 65 70 bucks or something in in the rest of the country yeah. not in california of course but so it was like it was a really big deal for us to get two rooms for like eight guys we would only just get one room and he'd put you know four and two beds and like two on the floor and like two in the van and it'd be like two no and like once a week i'd be like come on guys we had a fucking killer merch night two rooms two rooms everybody started chanting two rooms two rooms does that mean everybody got a bed it's like you still had to share one but it's like dude you got a bed it was yeah, like and there's preferably a hotel next to a waffle house so you could eat waffle house and just go directly to sleep with oh just covered in sodium and grease yep. but yeah i mean it was i remember sleeping in places and on floors in like new orleans and stuff with cockroaches everywhere i mean keith our trumpet player for some reason cats and animals like to pee on him like the first couple of years sleeping on floors i think three or four times he had like what the oh this cat oh Aww. or his shoes or, i mean it was always poor guy man he was always as he said, why am I the brunt of the world's punishment? I don't know, man. You just bring it on yourself sometimes, Keith. <laughs> you know, the, but yeah, it was rough, oh man. God. But you know, when you're when you're 19, dude, you don't care. You're just so stoked to be out there. I mean, at least I did, and I was, I just always loved travel so much that it was it was always an adventure. But yeah, after you know a month or two, you'd miss home for sure. Yeah, it's all mindset, and and the the idea that you're gonna get through it. You've got your your crew with you. And that kind of like, I think that's really what kind of brought us uh, bands like us through those hard times is just having your people with you. If you were alone, totally. if you were alone by yourself with no real purpose, like having a purpose, like, okay, we have to get to the show, play the show. Right. Like that's your purpose. Play the right? show. And, and it's your one hour or 40 minutes a day. Or it all revolves around that. Yeah, yeah. You can endure a lot of shit to get to that you know if you have that whatever that totally. purpose is in life so whatever it is i think that's a little life hack for anybody out there looking to do something crazy you just make sure you you have a, a goal at the end of every day purpose <laughs> yeah purpose yeah, yeah seriously so uh for sure so how, you know how how goes it like was it always good like once you started touring was it did it just keep climbing or was there some craziness? That it was, what happened? I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, 25 years, Mad Caddies have been just full up and down, man. It's just, it's kind of just been the, the trajectory of, you know, kind of normal life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we started off, it was, it was real tough for us in the beginning because we came out, our first record was 97. Um, and Scott was kind of already like, nearing its plateau it only had like two more years and then in, in 99 it was fucking dead dude 
new metal was out it was limp biscuit and then like you know progressive power pop punk stuff we you know all those that new east coast sound and like screamo and all that shit and like Scott was done man we were we were fucked we you know we're, we're hoping that after two years of 97 98 doing all those really good support slots working our asses off opening for lesson jake aerobic fish and no effects and everybody all around the country um would pay off and then we tried to do our own you know we did some fat tours and you know and things were going really well for us in canada we hadn't and we hadn't been to europe yet until i'm um, 99 but we we tried to do our own stuff and, and it just didn't work especially when um it was kind of building and building. Then we finally went to Europe in 99. It, we had two records out already there. Um, and shit just blew up for us there. It was like, boom, like, okay, Scott just got there. Thank God. Okay. And we got to ride the whole Scott wave through England and all of main, mainland Europe from like 99 to like 2002, 2003. Um, and, uh, it never slowed down for us over there. It finally slowed down in about oh five when we hadn't had a record in a couple of years and started to see numbers drop. But it basically, I think it peaked in about let's see, probably two thousand four for us over there. But yeah, we went from opening, doing some support slots over there, to boom, like our third time headlining. And by like the fifth time over there, we were in the big cities selling out sometimes two thousand seat halls on our own. And just like a household name, you know, getting played on mainstream radio in Germany and in England and and kind of the same went for Canada. But the States, to this day, we still have not really cracked. We've got the coasts, yeah, you know, yeah. but we don't, you know, we, we don't have the, the fan base that say, you know, our contemporaries do like Lesson Jake and Real Big Fish, our bros. Like we never had the, the ska single on the radio like those guys did that kind of created this bigger umbrella that went out into the midwest and to, to the other markets and yeah the caddies for some reason just didn't get there and we we tried to go the punk rock rec, uh, route opening for fat punk bands and stuff and people liked us but we always got the fucking haters or like, whatever it's not punk it's you know not punk enough and and we made some pretty punk records over the year rock the punk experience straight like punk album mm -hmm. with horns right. and tried to appease to those guys but yeah so that's that's basically been our career is like europe canada kind of saved us and then um now we finally you know the last five you know 10 years we you know we are we're a household name you know for people who know ska and punk music yes. sure yeah but for sure. just for not sure. but just not as it's you'd be surprised like people are like oh yeah and less j catch 22 rubik fish they go mad caddies they go who they go what yeah. <laughs> it's like it's weird so I don't know. Hmm. Our, our band's always kind of been an enigma, but it, it, it's been a hell of a ride, that's for sure. Well, all I can say is, uh, obviously, I've known you guys for a long time. You guys have been really good as long as I've known you. Um, I, you know that that can happen. Just like certain regions, certain countries, like that kind of happened with us in the UK. I could, I could go through why MXP isn't as big there. Sure, but uh, you know, it's like it's for reasons. I mean, it straight up is, but how did it feel for you guys finally hitting in Europe? Like that must've felt great. I mean, cause it does. Oh, it, it felt doesn't... so good. Yeah. It's different. I, I'll there. never forget. It was, it was 2000, 2001. It was my, it was Jan. We, we went over there in January. I was always a big proponent of touring in the worst weather months, especially in Canada and Europe because other bands put out and they stay home. I go, dude, tour in January and February, everybody will come out. And it worked. It does work. Those tours would always sell out because they don't. They live there. They don't care if the weather is bad. They're gonna come to this show, man. Just Everybody's get there. out in the summertime. <laughs> right, right. I'm like winter tour, winter tour. That's what I'm writing. But, uh, I'm writing during the summer usually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so I uh, okay. We booked our first headlining Mad Caddies tour, um, just UK, and it was two weeks. And the big one was um, was. Uh, yeah, what well, was the place called? They ripped it down. We we all played there a million times. They had the thousand seater underneath, and then the, the two thousand seat, the famous theater right there. Fuck! Oh my god, it's where at? the Astoria, oh. Astoria, London. Oh, in London. Okay, got so it. that yeah, so that was the big one, and the Astoria, the big room was sold out. It was this fucking huge deal, and uh, the first time I ever saw bootleggers selling Mad Caddy shirts outside, I was like, yeah, we made it, dude. Yeah. We're selling five dollar fucking shirts outside. Hell yeah. And, uh, yeah, every show on that tour was sold out apart, I think, from one. 
and uh, we made lifelong friends this band called farce they're all they're like brothers to us still this british uh, ska punk band they're so good from birmingham and uh their bass player ended up playing with us for a couple years later later down the road but anyway we had the best time and uh it was the first time we were on our own bus it was a little single decker british bus and you know we had our video games and we were and it was the first time we'd ever come home from a tour with like money like money you could live on for a few months like dude no way we actually did this and it was the first time was that was too yeah it's the first time we really actually made some money in the four four years of the band you know not just okay we can pay the rent this month and we got to go back out on tour like, yeah. wow that was crazy guys and it felt like okay and i remember having my birthday it's january um late like january and while we were in ireland and i had a day off and it was just raining and i can't remember 2001 i could do the math figure i was old in my early 20s but yeah that was when i finally realized okay we can do this like we've got if we just keep making decent records or hopefully great records yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah um then i think we got a career and i, I realized i'm like this is what i want to do like okay not gonna give up not gonna go back and do something else i'm like we, we got this and yeah never look back wow. here we are amazing and you're still still here rocking 26 years now <laughs> That's a long Fucking time. A, man. That's a long time to it is. and and you were talking about, you know, when when just the industry was well, you didn't say that, but around two thousand five yeah. when things started kinda of going down, like that was everybody, the whole music industry by two thousand seven, two thousand eight, it was completely different. Like I know royalties were trickling, uh drying up oh, yeah. for a lot of people. Uh it was just very bleak and very hard to get promoters for one i remember this with mxpx prom getting promoters to actually promote the way they used like it was weird it was like nobody was giving any promotion to oh, any of the bands except for like i totally remember top. that yeah it was so weird right. um we experienced that across no Europe, love. across you you know the uk yeah. across the u.s even in those years but uh hey we all came through that mad caddies made it through i've seen you guys all over the world since then and uh for sure yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of funny. It's like a lot of people ask me, how do you how do you stay together? One, you know, in a band so long. How do you stay in the music business for so long? And <laughs> I think honestly, the the easiest thing I could say is not that this is easy. Is literally just don't quit. Don't give right. up. Like don't stop. Don't give up. And, and there's lots of different you know levels of of you know success, right? So sure, um, not everybody's as good of a guitar player as another person, or as a good a singer. But like, if right. you find your niche, you find that you have an audience that wants to hear what you have to say. Uh, just don't quit, and you're going to be successful. Right? Yeah. So I would agree. Agree, hundred percent. Let's talk songwriting because it's hard to write songs when you're having so much fun on the road, when you're selling out every day. It's like there's so much going on. Now, how did you guys find time to write? Was it always off of tour, like when you got home? Yeah, mostly. The Caddies songwriting, it's, it's kind of a collective. Um, it's primarily um, myself and Sasha. Sasha doesn't write lyrics, um, and he rarely writes complete songs. He's like the riff, idea, melody guy, like always comes up with these cool parts. And like, you know, he's, he's just not the... His ADHD doesn't allow him to usually finish a song completely by himself. Yeah. It's like but he's an amazing start. songwriter. Right. And so, like, traditionally, like, I would either have my own song. Okay, here it is. Here's it's done. But especially in the early days, I wasn't as competent of a guitar player. So Sasha would, like, come up and make it, Punch catify it, it would call it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. make it awesome. And then with his tunes, he'd like, okay, come to me. Like, okay, here's this idea. I got this melody idea, kind of like, la, la, la. I'm like, okay, cool. I dig on that, man. And then start working on lyrics and a melody and maybe come up with a guitar part, maybe write a bridge or help him finish it. And we worked collaboratively like that for years, and we still do. And now um, Todd, our drummer, he's a song, like a commercial songwriter producer professionally. Like, does a lot of commercial music and jingles and stuff and and writes, um, like, library music and stuff. Um, so he's always got tunes now. How how long and, was he uh, doing that? Was that from the beginning? Not from the beginning of the band, right? Like, no, he's like been he's modern. been doing that shoot for the last at least the last like yeah, 13, 15 years, something. Okay. So it is long a, time. Sort of a side career for him, as well. Oh yeah, full on. And Sasha as well. Sasha is like a professional producer. He's um 
He's recently been working with Doja Cat, um, kind of as her right hand man for the last like four or five years, helped develop her. Are you familiar with Doja Cat? Yeah, yeah. I've she's been... yeah, pop like full on pop star now. Yeah, yeah. He helped her come up producing her early stuff since she's like eighteen, and like yeah. So Sasha's super busy. He's a full studio rat hermit. Just where do you find see the, the time light with all that success? Where do you find the time for Mad Caddies? Or do you well, drive, we, I mean, drive that train a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, um, Graham and I, uh, my bass player and my buddy, uh, we, we handle, like, the business and the um, kind of, like, logistical end of the band. Um, and then those guys kind of kick in with helping um, do recording demos and producing songs and stuff, which is a great asset. Yeah, That's where they bring, it, bring their specialty and offer their services um, when we're demoing and stuff. Yeah. So it kind of all works out. But, yeah, I mean, the, the caddy's, like... You know, it hasn't really been a full-time operation in a long time, you know. We kind of decided a long time ago that unless we were in a record cycle, you know, a record cycle, we're like, okay, we'll, we'll give it like 90, 100 days for a year or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but when we're not in the record cycle, we're like, yeah, you know, 40, 50 days a year is good on the road, kind of something. And um, just kind of do the stuff that works and not waste time anymore with the stuff that doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, of course. You know, after this time, and just and make it our whole things. We it, we want it to be fun. You know, obviously we, we we need to make a living. We're adults with families and and mortgages and stuff. But um, yeah, you, you still want to make it fun, yeah. and that's we still amazingly all get along pretty well. I mean, of course, we've had major dramas over the years where people hate each other for a long time, or not hate each other, but you know, hold uh, you Bridges. know feelings of animosity. <laughs> yeah. Let's say, but we've always been good about about flushing it out and not not letting it carry over into the next deal and, and crushing all that shit you know because it's no fun to be, be out there when you don't like people absolutely uh, how did you learn that dynamic was that just natural because you guys were good friends and you're just good people yeah or... it, it's because this this band wasn't started by like hey you know meet the guy at the guitar center or guitar shop or put up a flyer or craigslist ad you know yeah yeah absolutely we were we were all legitimately friends i mean todd and todd and graham our bass player and our bass player is two years younger so he wasn't in the band until shoot i think he got like 12 years 13 years ago or something but he wasn't in the on the first few records um because he was a little bit younger but him and todd have known each other since they're like three sasha and todd have known each other since they're five I've known Todd since he was like six because we all raced BMX bikes together. I mean, we're like known each other since we we're little fucking kids. So it's like before we ever even played music, we were like doing pool parties and having our moms cut off the crust of our fucking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You know, it's like wow. that you can't you can't go any deeper than that. Yeah. And then we came of age together, man. We, we, we got wasted at high school parties and, and shared the same girlfriends over the years. And like, girl, I mean, I mean, it's crazy, you know, it's like life. We, we grew up together. So that bond is, is, I say it's like a family. I'm like, it's the closest thing that I have to blood family, that family that feels like real family. I mean, mm -hmm. they know when you're, we all know when each other are lying. We all know when we're full of shit. I mean, there's just, everything's open in the band, you know? And it's cool. We've we've come a long way, and um, we're really good about communicating now. And it's 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 a pleasure to to work on tunes now. It's fun because we yeah. took away all that that competitive bullshit we had when we were all young and dumb. And no, oh, I want my chords are cooler. It's like no, nah, whatever sounds better sounds better. The don't ownership. This is all of ours, and we're making it for everyone. So who fucking cares? You know. Yeah, it is funny how. Yeah. You you grow up, you kind of like look back and you're like, okay, I was dumb about this. I, I was a little too precious yeah. about this and this and this. And, and you try to move forward and just easier going. That's a great thing when you can realize, oh, we've actually grown as people to where yeah. we can make this thing together and not give a fuck about this and you know all the things that we used to care about, little things. Right. Like my son, or you know, he, we'll be at the park with his friend and his he doesn't want his friend to like use his pistol or his gun you know whatever his toy is because he thinks right. that he's going to take off with it which we all know right. because there's a social contract it's like no he's not gonna right. he's just going to look at it and right. he's going to give it back but right. it takes us a while as humans to learn all that right like that it's it's kind it of, does. it's okay you know we just need to figure it out together that's so cool man hearing hearing more about how you guys came up, Mad Caddies. I'd love to hear more about your day-to-day, -day, like, 
you know, you're talking about how it's not necessarily full time. So what else do you do with your time? Do you, do you mind talking about maybe family life or home life or? Yeah, sure, man. Um, like today I've been working in the, I live, um, I've got uh, 12 acres kind of in, I'm close to town, but I, I couldn't hit my near, the only house I could see, I couldn't hit it with a golf ball. It's across the canyon. I can see it out my window, but I'm out in the hills. Um, and, uh, I like living rurally, but I'm like 10 minutes to town, which is cool. So yeah, I've been working in the garden all morning. It's, you know, getting it ready, been planting for the last month and I like working outside. Um, and, uh, yeah, the last year, I mean, basically, um, uh, when we got canceled from the pandemic, I turned around, came home and like town shut down my little town. I grew up in Los Olivos. It's now like wine tasting Disneyland. It's literally 55 tasting rooms in two square blocks. And like they shot return, they shot return to Mayberry there, like in the eighties when I was a kid, like it's a classic little old West town, um, little settlement, like the train used to end there. You'd get on the stagecoach. But I grew up like in a village just right by there and all my friends are there. And um, my buddy and my bass player in my new solo project, um, Chuck Robertson and Friends, um, has an old family property there right in the heart of where fucking all of Los Angeles wine people descend every weekend. And he's got this old family plot um, with a cool old house and it's our um, studio, uh, rehearsal space and recording studio. And it's just beautiful. It's this this yard with all these old trees and giant rocks and this beautiful botanical garden with all these old tractor pieces. And there's this iconic choo-choo train um, barbecue that my buddy built. That's like, looks like a locomotive, but it's a working like three piece smoker that everybody congregates around out front. And um, I ended up pretty much spending the last year. Well, let's see yeah, a year and two months there um, at least five days a week. Um, those guys, my bass player, he's a heavy equipment operator, but he's his own boss and fucking drives in sandals usually. And uh, he's usually off by like three or four. And then um, guitar player Nick, also a construction worker, a guy I grew up with, and he's been the roadie for the Mad Caddies in the summer for years, being our guitar tech because he gets to take summers off. And um, and then another buddy on drums, and we just started fucking around like last year. And I'm like, shit, we've got like an album's worth of songs. And so started recording. Um, finished by october and then by christmas we had another album's worth of songs i'm like man let's go and so we ended up going up to prairie sun studios up in sonoma um last january and february and cutting a whole nother record and so now i'm sitting here with two records so that's what i did that was day to day for the, wow. the last year was just making these two albums and like we just go and rehearse and then the first one we kind of just recorded one to two days a week because my engineer has a little baby and full-time job recording and making cabinets and stuff and so he was giving us a day or two weeks so we made it real slowly and then the second one we rehearsed for like a month and just went and hammered it out old school recorded on a neat board and just went played live and then like went back and did vocal overdubs and stuff it was an awesome experience so that's basically what sorry wow, that's cool um that's basically what i've been up to the last year is just becoming a full-time songwriter um um and studio rat and uh yeah it's it's been amazing i've it's the first time i've ever had total freedom to record all the music i wanted to yeah. that doesn't fit the box of the mac daddies i was gonna um, ask like what you know what is this sounding like compared to the mad caddies i mean i hate to of course we shouldn't compare it but people may oh yeah no it's totally, like well it's interesting the, the first one um like i have a single coming out in a couple of weeks um we're doing a full kickstarter and launching the record and everything what's, what's through the called? kickstarter um the single's called mountain flower cool and uh the new record is called all out of dreams and uh yeah they, the single and the record are going to drop on june 11th dope wow that's exciting yeah. so you've yeah you've been working super for super exciting all year and finally it's coming out and it's uh is it is dude it finally and i have two records are no, you? well, so, yeah, we just decided to self-release. Um, I got my management handling it. and um, um, I like that idea. What what made you decide? Was there main factors or? Well, to, oh, as opposed to self-releasing or uh, putting it on a label? As opposed to, yeah, being on a label. Yeah, um, good old good old Vincent Friel from uh, Less Than Jake. I called him uh, <laughs> as an advisor. <laughs> Vinny. Yep, Vinny. Smart man, and uh, 
we we're just kind of finishing up the second record and um i'm like dude i've got this first record and fat doesn't want to put it out because it's too mellow it's it's kind of like um well i'd say it's singer songwriter i guess that's what we registered it at um but it's full band mm -hmm. you know it's it's got like a rock feel underneath it but it's full on mellow kind of singer songwriter there's like one kind of hard song on it um and fat's like you know aaron was like yeah i love it it's just it's too too far out of our wheelhouse and i'm like yeah totally and i'm like yeah maybe some some other label and i, and I called Vinny. i'm like what should i do with this man and he's like dude just put it out yourself he's like do a kickstarter um if you've already paid for the record and it's done he's like then you know and you're not going to tour on it right now because of the pandemic blah, blah blah he's like just put it out man and yeah, just register all the songs and do it. It's it's amazing now how easy it is. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like talk, talk to some people and he's like, yeah, hire this company, help with your Kickstarter and do this whole thing. I'm like, cool. And so that's really exciting. That's all in the, the process um, right now. So you're doing a Kickstarter? And so, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're launching it. Um, uh, I think it's, it starts soon. It starts at the end of May and then, or maybe June 2nd. I'm not sure. Okay, but this um, comes yeah, out June, this comes out May the, 31st. The, no, no, no. The the single and the album drop June eleventh, but the Kickstarter is going to start, I think, a week or ten uh, b before the album launches. Sure. What I'm saying is this pod and then, this podcast will come out May thirty first. Oh, perfect. So Fuck, literally days before people will. That's awesome. Be able to. Yeah, Chuck okay. Chuck Robertson and friends. Chuck Robertson and friends is the name of the group, and we got an Instagram, and there will be a a web page that's already getting built right now. All right, I'll add that, that to all the uh, show notes yeah. as well for sure. Okay, cool. Wow. Okay, um, yeah, that's a big project, man. Like, so you're, so you're dude, Kickstarter. It's been huge. Talk about the Kickstarter because uh, I know a little yeah. bit about Kickstarter. For we've done it. It's uh, um, stressful, I would say. <laughs> How much do you ask for? What do you What do you offer? Totally. You know, like all this is. Things. This was a conversation with the Mad Caddies. Um, sorry, I'm going to grab another water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all good. This was a, a conversation with the Mad Caddies. Uh, for years when we, you know, talked about like, well, should we put another record out on that or maybe we just like, you know, do a Kickstarter and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and we just always, we, we just always decided against it. I don't know for what reasons. I was never against it, but um, the guys just decided against it. And uh, so when it was proposed to me, I'm like, well, I have no idea how to do this. And I'm, a, you know, I just got this iPad. I'm a total tech phobe. And uh See, I don't even know how to turn the dinging off. Stop it. Stop texting me, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> the ding, uh, do not disturb. Yeah, it's... Ding. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, the so Kickstarter, Kickstarter yeah. Uh, we hired... Yeah, so hire we, hired an outside, we hired an outside consulting company um, to handle and run the Kickstarter. And it's really cool. That's, what, that's all they do. And they run Kickstarters. And um, you can choose, like, what what tier of services you, you want, you know, and what percentage they take of the Kickstarter, depending on all the services to provide. But yeah, it goes all the way to them um, actually um, housing and delivering physical product, kind of act, acting as a record label for the period of the Kickstarter, which is really cool for artists who do not have the capabilities to house vinyl and ship t-shirts and do all this stuff. And so that's, they basically become your label for the period of the, the Kickstarter and then help market it and, and do all that, which is really cool. That's great. Okay. Yeah. I would say, uh, there's like two. Okay. One of the... What's that? Oh, go ahead. There's three main parts to, to a Kickstarter. And you know, the, the first part would be, you know, the launch and then, you know, the, the, right. And then selling through, keeping going through till it ends. And then through your goal. And then right. if you get the, you know, you reach your goal, a lot of bands don't realize or acts don't realize how much work it is. Once you're done with what everybody deems to be the hard part, which is selling it, now you've got to right. fulfill it. Now you've got to pack, you know, get all the packaging, and all that. And that is a nightmare to keep all the people like, did you get right. this bundle or this bundle? And did you get that extra right. on perk? So, yeah, it can be a, a nightmare. So you, the, the fact that you have somebody that, that to help you do that 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 was what we were worried about yeah huge, and yeah. that's so yeah it's it's been great and just working with those guys and they're they're dudes of our elk you know they were in touring bands our age they're, they're they know the deal you yeah. know oh yeah. my god our, our okay what friends, uh, steve sablasi what is that how do you how do you, how do you know that 
Oh, I I know Steve. He's been on my podcast. He he uh he actually you know. Wait, but but why? How did how did you know Steve Zabasi was texting me? Oh, I didn't know he was texting you. <laughs> is he texting you? What the fuck? That is a trip. I'm That's just, a fucking trip. Why did you just say his name? Oh my god. Hey, what's up, Steve? Because he uh. Well, one, that's why we're talking about that. I had a feeling he, you were working with him on uh, this. this. Uh, I did, he didn't. Yeah, he, services. he set yeah, yeah. up. He set up this interview, but he didn't say oh, anything duh, right. about Kickstarter or about his uh, company. Uh, uh. He was just like acting like, "Hey, my friend Chuck." I'm like, "Yeah, oh, how slack?" Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah like, Funny. Yeah, he doesn't. I mean. Me and Steve are friends, so it's fine that he did that. But like, I was like, "Oh yeah, of course, no problem, anytime, man." Like, uh, yeah. But yeah, I love that he's doing that because Steve is a smart guy. He knows he knows what's up. He's a hard worker. He's a totally. great, great songwriter as well. But uh, so weird that he was texting you right when I said his name. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm like, Steve, stop, man. Okay. So ah, yeah, Jesus. Kickstarter, man. Like, uh, went so. You may, I don't know if you want to tell people some of the stuff that you're going to offer. Uh, obviously, vinyl, that's going to be one, like some vinyl variations. Yeah, maybe. totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to do um, basic, like the, the basic stuff. You get the, the digital album with the liner notes and all that stuff. And like um, some normal things as the tears go up, you're getting into vinyl and t shirts and cool collectible pins and stuff like that. And then all the way up to, like exclusive live streams and limited edition prints of the, um, the single artwork. Um, mm -hmm. My girlfriend, um, Cassie's been doing, um, she did the artwork for House on Fire and for the last two Mad Caddy singles. She's got a really cool style. Oh, so. yeah, that's cool. She's been, she's yeah, she's again. been doing the, um, the art for her. She did the single artwork for Mountain Flower. And um, yeah, we shot this really fun video um, up at her place. She lives up at, uh, up in the mountains above our town and like, um, uh, grew up in these natural buildings and um, kind of cob house style off the grid solar, you know, way up there. And uh, we shot the um, shot the video up there. We got an old like eighties nineteen eighty six Toyota minivan, like the cool little boxy ones, and <laughs> strapped the stand up base to the roof and got these drone shots. We're like lost up in the mountains. We finally found the party up there. It's fun. But yeah, we did a really cool music video to go along with Mountain Flower. And uh, yeah, that all comes out on the eleventh. And um, yeah, I think. I, don't know, I think people are gonna like it. My friends all like it, and uh, I respect their opinions. They don't lie to me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's been it was a lot of fun making it, and uh, really getting to take the time on the first one, and then having the confidence the second one to actually book a, a studio and go up. And, and we stayed up on this farm for a couple weeks and recorded it up there, old school. And yeah, it's just been such a neat experience. And it's weird on the second one, it, it kind of started to develop more into. Mad Caddies without horns. <laughs> it's like there's some reggae and some ska and some like hard punk. And it's like, okay, I'm just kind of finding my style. And yeah, we actually just played our first show yesterday um, at our studio um, in the garden. We opened it up and um, that's what we used to do before the pandemic and just have free form jams with not free form, but like a group of guys will play for like four or five hours. And everybody kind of trades off and the tourists come in and it's all free and our buddies come and. So just kind of an open party we do like once a month. So we did that um, last Saturday or yesterday, and it was fun. First show since the whole pandemic, and I yeah. felt human. They uh, started to lift the mask mandates, and most people I know are vaccinated. It's like okay, it felt, we're, we're getting see, back. Did it look and feel fairly normal? Like, yeah, I mean it's a big garden, so like, you know, it felt like an awkward barbecue party there's like 120 people there spread out in a big yard and then finally halfway through people start coming up to the front and dancing okay we're not gonna play it's like some a wedding but it's all like our that. friends pre-covid some of the events were like that or <laughs> most of i mean a so, lot of those outdoor things totally. you know if it's a free thing people just yeah. come by and yeah no that's yeah, cool but, uh, that's, that's it's great fun we felt like a band it. and then we and it was so weird we played two albums worth the material almost <laughs> like we didn't play all the songs but we're like that no one's never heard and we're like wow this is weird like what kind of band what is this going to sound like when it's all together and we're like yeah kind of like tom petty kind of found some um no effects in sublime records like cool right on okay i love that, uh, so I people, love that idea yeah that. So it's <laughs> that, kind of what it is it's kind of like my classic rock and americana roots coming out into kind of like melding with you know the modern mad yeah. caddy sound I'm, I I I feel like people these days are. I mean, if it's a good song, they're gonna love it, you know. 
And, uh, you know, just e- even talking about House on Fire, you know, the last EP that Mad Caddy's put out, it's got a newer sound in my, you know, it's got a new, more modern sound that you guys maybe have built off of, of course. But there's a couple ideas in there that are stuff that I hadn't really heard you guys do. Yet it feels totally natural. It feels good. Uh, yeah. The, what was it? Uh, Waiting for the Real Thing. It, it's got like the... F- like a fifties Motown vibe, maybe even Huey Lewis in the news. Full, full Huey Lewis. I and I feel like that's Huey like, Lewis, so. that's the most mad caddy song on that record. That's like, okay, that's the caddies with the full horns blasting and mm-hmm. like kind of taking something and making it our own. Like that's like definitely my favorite tune on that record for sure. As far as like being like a mad caddy song, you know? Sure. But I really, yeah. uh, track one, uh, let it go. Or is it called Let It Go? Yeah, Let It Go. Let It Go. Yeah. It starts out so beautiful. I, I love the way it starts. It just hooks you right away, like with the with the, oh, thanks, the vocal man. line. And and then it just continues to be just a really solid song, but not – I mean, it's 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 kind of – I guess it's ska-ish or reggae-ish or whatever. It's, it's reggae. Got, yeah, it's, it's got – I don't know. You guys do something that takes it out of – you just make it your own. And I, don't, I can't yeah. without maybe dissecting well, that's, it that's, further. That's but. Sasha, man. That Sasha, his production, like the bass lines he comes up with and stuff, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's always what really makes it. It's like, you know, because when I listen to like, oh, my demo version of the song, and then when I hear what he does to it, it's like, oh, dude. It's so good. <laughs> He's, he finds the magic. I don't know. So well, that, That's what makes the Mad Caddy sound, I guess, is, is you guys all together. It is. But I, lo- I really, really, like I said, I keep dishing about it, but it's great. It's a great sound. And I, I hope you guys continue with some of those ideas just because, you know, it's for sure. It's five yeah, we're, songs, we're finally getting excited enough. to get back together. Yeah, it's not. Enough. Yeah. So I kind of I guess my solo project kind of took off where House on Fire left it. Yeah, Cause that was my first kind of personal. There's a few songs on there real personal about my divorce like four years ago and splitting up with my wife and my my kid and stuff. And um, and then um. Yeah, so the fir- there's a few songs that are left over from that batch on my first solo record, and then kind of we take off into the next chapter onto the second one. Cool, which is which is exciting. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. Storytelling. So have you storytelling? Always- yeah, I don't know. I I got somehow um, in the last few years somehow it just started to come out of me more. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I think maybe <clears throat> because I've spent so much time last four or five years really purposefully seeking out and trying to listen to as much music as I can. Um, especially with, you know, iTunes and everything. It's so awesome. It's like anything you want, you know? Yeah. And so I really took advantage of that after, after my divorce, especially, and just, um, I live alone, you know, in my house and, and I just, I have a lot of solitude and time and I'm just, I have to make the most of this and really try to be productive. And, um, I, I think, um, just listening to a lot more music really helped to getting away from the red, just consuming whole records for a few weeks and really listening to them all the way through over. And just, I think it, it started to help me kind of um, figure out w- what I wanted to say and where, how I wanted to say it. And it, it started naturally coming out kind of subconsciously. And that's cause I, I normally it's like, I you beat my head up. I, I started a lot of songs, but I just never finished them, you know? And now it's like, if I have, if I have something that I like, I'm, I'm not just going to let it sit around and go, okay, let's, let's get the pen to paper. Let's finish the song, man. This is good. And let's get it into the studio and let's fucking record it. What, Even then, let's, it, you know. What changed your mindset on that? Was it having more time to yourself or? Yeah, having more time to myself and also having the modern capabilities. Um, mm-hmm. You know, back when we had to use tape machines and shit to record demos, it sucked. And like, I was a little late to the game, but fuck, I got an iPhone like seven, eight years ago or whatever. And uh, just having that voice recorder on the iPhone just changed my life. So easy. And my house sound has good acoustic. So I just sit at the kitchen table where I'm sitting right now with my, my acoustic. And I can just set my phone there and like listen back. And go, oh, cool. That sounds great. So you can easily send. And then I would just text message all those ideas to my band members. And, and you know, the last few years, and do you like this or not? Or like, oh, yeah, that's rad. Or, eh. you know, and so it's easy to, to sift yeah. Sift through the chaff, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. And it's like, um, and then I can look, and I, I started my, you know, I went back recently when, before we went into the studio, and I'm like, am I missing anything from the last, say, three years? And you know, I go back, I'm like, okay, there's like 250 voice notes in there. I'm like, 
okay, I just got to go through each one. Some of them aren't named, but I'm like, if they're not named, they're usually not that okay. good. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's my <laughs> because the good ones. You always put some name on it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I did mine some gold in there, and like I ended up finding like one that like ended up on the on the um, the second record that I'd forgot about, and it was one that we were just kind of jamming, and then, we, and then we ended up having time at the end. They're like, dude, let's do that one. And I'm like, all right, fuck it. And now it's like, oh, I like that one. So it's it's so. It, yeah, it's just so useful to have that tool now that yeah. we didn't have, say, 10 years ago. I mean, it's, yeah. I was just doing that, by the way, just the other day. And there's a couple white whales or, or whatever you want to call them. There's a couple, like, ideas that I have that I still know about. I haven't finished the song. It's, like, one part that's, like, oh, this part is epic. Like, it's a right, chorus right. or something, but I don't have the words. I just have, like... But then you're, like, I never figured out the verse. Yeah, I never... I never so I have a couple of those right. that I'm just, like, someday I'm going to finish that song. And, and I keep thinking about, like, a few different ones in my mind, but... I'm sure you, you probably have some of that too, but it is a good dude, feeling. I, and dude. Go yeah, and, and never let never fucking let go of those good parts because um oh what was it? Uh it doesn't matter how old they are, if they're fresh now I mean no, if they're no. good, they're good. And no Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. Oh, my favorite song on our second record that my and it was my second favorite song to play live, but it was my favorite heavy one the, yesterday was uh a song that the riff is literally like 23 years old. I wrote the riff like in 98 when I remember specifically when I was 21 years old living at this one house in Santa Barbara. And I remember writing that riff because in my mind it was like a, a nod to like Dinosaur Jr. It's like kind of in like open E and A, like way up on the neck, like doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, fucking whatever. And I could never find a fucking song for that riff. And um, I always carried it in my back pocket, you know. And then I had this other chorus, but I didn't have a verse. And I started playing, and I played both of them in the studio. And then one day I was just like, dude, you can mix those. They work. Holy shit. And I had this epiphany, and then my bass player was like, yeah, man, let's play that one where you, you mix the two songs. You mix the two old songs. Let's do that one. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of cool. And it started working, and I'm like, how cool is that? A 22-year-old riff meets with a two-year-old riff and becomes like the coolest song and my, my, my favorite song on the record. I'm like, Amazing. see? Never yeah. fucking let go of those things, man. That's right. And, and it was the same with my guitar player, Nick. He had this one riff um, on the first record for the second single, and it's this sweepy melody that plays throughout the whole song that comes in and out, this like arpeggiated guitar riff. He's like, dude, I've had that riff for 18 years. I've been waiting to use it. 18 years. <laughs> He's like, you finally wrote this song in the right key. I'm like, yeah, there you go, bro. <laughs> yes. So fun. It is so true. The key matters too. Like, I, I have certain Never things. forget the riffs. Just keep them in your back pocket, yeah. boys and girls. Always certain remember riffs that. I've written, and then I change the key, and I can't use that riff part, but I use the rest of the song. Totally. The riff is on its own. It's an orphan riff. Right, orphan riff. An orphan yeah. riff. Right. Uh, yeah, we, need an, we need an orphanage for the riffs. <laughs> We do a little. That's what our yeah. voice mess voice memos are for, dude. That's so. Totally. I mean, that's what's funny about songwriting is like, we all kind of have similar experiences, you know. And even though we're kind of doing it differently, but like, there's only so many ways you can write down ideas and remember them. And like, yeah. So I used yeah. to have like a little mini cassette recorder, those micro cassette recorders. Oh yeah, yeah. Took yeah. those all over the world. I remember being like. In a field in Australia, just like sit with my recorder, right. sh sh write songs, and, totally. and here we are now with with iPhones, and it, I had right. uh, the the big cassette, either you know, the regular size cassette recorder that's like the giant black thing. I had one of those. No, we call it, no. That's what we Mad Caddies all had. Mad Caddies issued TCM nine two niners. Is that what they <laughs> tape cassette machine nine two nine Sony mm -hmm. called them the TCM nine two niner? Yeah, the black one, man. You yeah, fucking, it was just yeah. I'd sit with, you know, I'd take that thing fucking everywhere. Yeah. Know? And you're sitting there rewinding, where was that cool party? You're like, ah. But you could use the uh, the count thing. You could have the counter start, uh -huh. start at some other part of the tape. So you can go back to the zeros and find your spot. It was. Uh, ah, and remember. Yeah. Because we, we used to, you know, of course, you as well. But when we recorded our all our first records, it was all the two-inch tape. It was, it was. 
It was oh, analog. Yeah. So you're punching our, in. Our and... first two, yeah, quality softcore and duck and cover were both done on, on analog. Yeah, punch. Dude, I remember a guy like, ooh, ah, and he'd hit it, punch in and out for the yeah. backup vocals. You had yeah. to get it just right. There was no, like, crossfit. <laughs> just right. Thing. And it'd be like, oh, sorry, bad punch, bad punch. Got to do it again. It wasn't your fault. <laughs> this is for the for the last 10 years now. At least that, this is how I, I record vocals. I go in, I sing, I like to sing the song eight times. Okay. All the way through. Some some songs, if, if it's a lot of breath, I'll be like, okay, we're going to take this verse chorus. Well, let's just keep doing the first verse and the chorus sure. eight times and then we'll move to the second. But, um. If it's generally just normal, then I, yeah, I sing it eight times. Is it? And then it, I'm like, okay, cool. Is it? Eight and then times I'll go out all the way through just, perfectly, or is it? Just you, yeah, you yeah. I, I mean, not per- perfectly, yeah. Uh, as perfectly, perfectly as you no. can. Well, okay. perfectly as I can. What I'm asking though is so like when we used to do comp, and then I'll, then I'll have them edit. Yeah. And then I'll have them comp. I'll, I'll go outside and chill for like 30 minutes, and I'm like, okay, dude, come in. And then the engineer will be like, okay, I'm just missing this part or this part, or yeah, I still yeah. didn't get this, or yeah. Do you, you ever ready to go to backgrounds? Own? No, I, I can't I can't stand sitting there and listening to someone comp my vocals. That's why I have to just, I want to give them a shit ton. Yeah. Like, I'll sing my ass off for fucking two hours or whatever. And like, no, okay, I'm going outside now. See, now and I'll come back in. This I, I, trust, I that, trust them. I do more like six takes, not eight, but... Sometimes I'll do eight, but I, okay, I, it I'll, just depends on how good yeah. I'm singing. If I'm singing really good, I'm like, I got it in four. I'm good. Like, Sure. Totally. But, uh, totally. I do my own comps. See, that's ah, the difference. And it's not I fun. can't listen, man. It was not fun. <laughs> no, I can't. No, because then I can't tell what's good or bad. And I'm like, I trust the engineers, man. It's like, yeah. There is something to be said about that outside perspective and that sort of just like – because other people would pick stuff that I don't pick, and I'm, exactly. I'm too hard on myself. And I'm like, I'm like, nah, you, man. You pick the I more just... perfect one rather than the better performance. Sometimes. The character, they yes. they find better performance, and I'm just listening to pitch, and they're not listening to pitch because you're not gonna fucking tune that shit anyway. So. <laughs> I'm like, only listening dude. to pitch, only. No. <laughs> but I don't tune my stuff. No, I mean, for most of the time. Yeah, it's been. They, tuned they put that past. stuff in a. What's it called? Tune core or in no? A straight, in a str- a voice straightener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not like Antares or anything. It's just making sure that you fucking got down to where you're supposed to. You never hear it or anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's you, like you can like... sing, but the, it's like it's almost like something they do a lot they. We're saying they as if the producers are now part of the government. Um <laughs> they are now. Yeah, they're part of the evil plan. <laughs> they part of the evil plan. But they uh they almost use it as a sound, like it's just part of the process of processing a vocal. Oh, the, the Antares, you know, like, yeah, I want to believe in that fact of all. Exactly. You know? Yeah. That was the first one. Yeah. That was. That was. Dude, that was... This but it was kind of used as an instrument. It's been yeah. a lot of fun. Uh, is there anything else? I mean, obviously, we, we covered your solo record coming up. Uh, it's out yeah, June, June 11th. June 11th, yep. Um, Chuck Robertson and Friends. Excellent. And you guys have all the, all the socials which i'll add to the yep oh yep for sure what a crazy time to be starting is it weird to be starting like a brand new thing in 2021 or is it It seems kind of right it's kind of exciting right kind of exciting because i mean dude the caddies we're not going to try to fight the fucking masses and tour in the fall after this like we're waiting until next year so yeah we're not going to be doing anything anyway so um it's just fun, and it just gives me something to do, you know, play some fun local shows regionally this summer and and uh, just try to get the, the word out because, yeah, it's it's something uh, I'm going to do on the side and, and keep making Chuck Robertson records and mm-hmm. keep making my caddy records. And, uh, yeah, we're excited. I guess that's the news is caddies are finally talking um, – because we all live separate. Graham lives here in the Valley in our hometown, but Sasha's in L.A., Todd's up in Oregon, Eddie's up in Oregon. And so um, we're planning on getting together this summer and actually try to get some studio time in and start working on some new stuff. There, Sasha and Todd are like, dude, we've got cool songs. I'm like, right on. I'm all used up. So uh, bring them on, man. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's 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 the thing. It's like it takes a little time. You got to live live a bit a little bit of life. Fill up your your ideas. It's a subconscious thing. Fill up the it's idea. Well. It's yeah. not even. It's not even like, oh, there's an idea, okay, or whatever. It's like that does happen, but. But you just it's just take a little time and then you get you come back. I, I never worry about that anymore. Sure. I'm sure you don't either. Um, yeah, it, it's like 
you know, I'll go, I'll, I'll write fucking five songs in, in like two weeks and then I'll go a month and not even pick up my guitar. So I'm just like waiting. Yeah. Like, oh, I feel it again. Yeah. Here, I got something to say again. I'm not going to push it, you know. I just noticed the more you do other stuff, especially like reading books and just kind of keeping your mind busy with other stuff, that's when you kind of start developing subconsciously developing ideas, you know. Absolutely. At least for me. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I feel on that. Just getting out there and doing things and it just comes comes pouring back in. Um, dude, it thank, does. You, thank you for writing the songs you've written, man, and keep it going. Yeah, yeah thanks like, for having me on your, on your podcast, dude. It's absolutely. awesome. Can't wait to hear the record. It's been a... Uh, Good to see you, man. An old uh, friendly face from the road, man. It's awesome to see you, Mike. Talk sure. to you. Appreciate right. it. Have a good one. Thanks, Chuck. Peace, love, respect, brother. Thanks, man. <laughs>